Step into a world where danger looms large and rules are mere guidelines. Today, we delve into the captivating stories of drug lords who sought to break free from the confines of prison. This cell is home to one of the most notorious and bloodthirsty narco-criminals of all time, Joaquin Guzman. Explore their intricate plans and bold actions as we uncover the gripping narratives of those who risked everything in pursuit of freedom. The life that Chapo Guzman lived inside Puente Grande was almost more luxurious than the Italian gangsters who were locked up. But amidst the adrenaline-fueled escapades, one question echoes. What drives these individuals to defy the odds? Join us as we dive deep into the fascinating realm of drug lords and their relentless pursuit of liberty. El Chapo. At the time of his arrest, El Chapo's cartel reigned as the wealthiest and most formidable among Mexico's drug syndicates. Its operations spanned continents, smuggling colossal amounts of cocaine from Colombia, traversing Mexico, and reaching the United States via air, sea, and land routes. Not stopping there, the cartel established distribution networks across the United States, ensuring its products reached far and wide. But that's not all. In addition to cocaine, the organization diversified its portfolio, venturing into the production, smuggling, and distribution of Mexican methamphetamine, marijuana, and heroin sourced from Southeast Asia. This broad spectrum of illegal activities cemented the cartel's position as a dominant player in the global drug trade, making a lasting impression on the criminal world. On January 19, 2001, El Chapo grew weary of his incarceration in Puente Grande, a formidable prison where he had been confined since 1995 following his involvement in a violent altercation. Despite his imprisonment, he relished certain privileges such as fine dining, engaging in volleyball matches, and enjoying the company of women, all arranged by the prison's deputy director of security, Damaso Lopez Nunez. Damaso went to great lengths to ensure El Chapo's comfort and satisfaction, creating a mutually beneficial arrangement. In the midst of this tale of opulence and corruption, one can't help but ask, is this what happens to drug lords in prison? Now, in exchange for these favors, El Chapo generously rewarded Damaso with financial gifts and extravagant presents, ensuring his loyalty and maintaining a luxurious lifestyle outside the prison walls. Additionally, Chapo took care of the medical expenses when one of Damaso's children was injured in an accident. However, things changed for El Chapo when Damaso left because of the rules against corruption within the prison. Then, on January 18, 2001, El Chapo faced another problem. The highest court in Mexico said it was okay to send Mexican prisoners to the United States of America. This made El Chapo scared he might end up in a United States jail. So the next day, he planned a daring escape with the help of a guard named Elito, who snuck him out in a laundry cart. For the next 13 years, El Chapo hid in the mountains, still running his drug business. Despite attending a family gathering and becoming more careless, he was ultimately apprehended by the police in February 2014, following revelations from some of his associates. But he got away again in July 2015, using a secret tunnel from his shower area in jail. The police searched everywhere for him and offered a big reward, but he stayed hidden. They caught him for the third time in January 2016 after a big fight with the police. Then in January 2017, he was sent to the United States to face serious charges. They found him guilty and sent him to ADX Florence in Colorado, which is known as the hardest jail in the United States of America. It's almost impossible to escape from there because of its strict rules and super tight security. So even though El Chapo might want to try again, the odds are not in his favor. Manuel Felix Beltron Manuel Felix was born on the 3rd of September 1958 in the locality of Llanos del Refugio, situated within Cosala, Sinaloa, in Mexico. His association with the Sinaloa cartel commenced in 1990, but it was upon the apprehension of his brother, Javier Torres Felix, in 2004, that he ascended to a prominent position within the organization. Collaborating with Ovidio Guzman Lopez, son of Joaquin Guzman Loera, Torres Felix took charge of overseeing the trafficking of narcotics from South America into the Mexican states of Chiapas and Oaxaca. Manuel found himself at the center of a high-stakes escape plot in year 2020, 
as the impending risk of extradition to the United States hovered over him. Before his capture, Manuel occupied a significant role as the chief financial officer within the notorious Sinloa cartel, a position that afforded him considerable power and influence within the criminal underworld. Moreover, his role as a lieutenant to El Chapo's son significantly boosted his standing, granting him access to a wide array of connections. These connections proved to be invaluable assets in navigating the complex and dangerous terrain of Mexico's criminal underworld. Despite the relentless efforts of law enforcement agencies to apprehend him, he successfully evaded capture for a significant period. Utilizing his extensive network of contacts and abundant resources, he skillfully outmaneuvered authorities, staying ahead of their pursuit. However, fortune eventually turned against him in October 2017, when Mexican authorities, armed with intelligence and determination, finally closed in on him at a luxurious residential enclave in the heart of Mexico City. Subsequently, Manuel found himself confined within the walls of the formidable Altiplano prison, renowned for its stringent security measures and its history of housing some of Mexico's most dangerous criminals. Even within the secure walls of this fortress-like facility, Manuel's resilience remained unwavering. He patiently waited for his fate, showing no signs of weakening. A year later, a critical error in judgment by prison authorities would inadvertently pave the way for Victor's audacious bid for freedom. In a fateful decision to transfer him to a supposedly less secure detention center in Mexico City, Victor seized upon the opportunity. On January 29, 2020, Victor and two fellow inmates embarked on a meticulously planned escape, exploiting vulnerabilities within the facility's infrastructure and security protocols. Their disappearance during the routine roll call sent shockwaves through the prison hierarchy. It triggered a thorough search effort that ultimately proved fruitless. Investigation into their escape revealed a meticulously orchestrated sequence of events, from manipulating unlocked cell doors to carefully navigating barriers and obstacles, resulting in a bold escape from the prison's boundaries. Surprisingly, the three individuals avoided being noticed as they took control of a vehicle within the prison grounds, using clever strategies to trick guards and get past security points. Their daring getaway, briefly caught on surveillance cameras, left prison officials astonished and law enforcement in a rush to capture the escapees. Despite the intensive manhunt that ensued, Manuel was on the run, and his location remained a mystery. Fast forward to the early hours of October 13, 2012, he met his demise during a gunfire exchange in the locality of Oso Viejo, Culiacan, Sinaloa. His remains were transported to the forensic center and under military guard to prevent any attempt by his associates to retrieve the body. After the altercation, the military seized numerous caches of firearms, ammunition, and related supplies. Prior to his death, Torres Felix occupied a pivotal position as a significant narcotics trafficker, collaborating closely with Ismael Zambada Garcia and Joaquin Guzman Loera, both notorious figures in Mexico's criminal landscape. Edgar Valdez Edgar Valdez Villarreal, famously known as La Barbie, born on August 11, 1973, assumed leadership of the Beltran Leva cartel between 2009 and 2010 following Arturo Beltran Leyva and preceding Hector Beltran Leyva. Hailing from Laredo, Texas, Edgar gained recognition as a football player in his hometown in Mexico. Dubbed La Barbie due to his resemblance to a Ken doll, he engaged in marijuana distribution during his high school years. Tragically, Edgar was involved in an accident where he struck a middle school counselor while speeding through the streets of Laredo. Fearing legal repercussions, he fled to Mexico where he leveraged his connections in the United States to ascend within the Beltran Leva cartel hierarchy. Authorities eventually apprehended Edgar, but his capture marked just one chapter in his turbulent story. Initially, Valdez emerged as a ruthless drug lord and a key lieutenant within the Beltran Leva cartel. However, his journey didn't end with his arrest. Starting as a mere member, he swiftly ascended the cartel's hierarchy leveraging his extensive connections in the United States. Eventually, he led an enforcement squad named Los Negros. Yet, his ambitions soared higher, particularly following the demise of his boss, Arturo Beltran Leva. 
Seizing the opportunity, Valdez plunged into a brutal gang conflict, resorting to barbaric methods like torture and decapitation, resulting in over 150 casualties. With both the DEA and Mexican government determined to bring him down, he was finally apprehended by Mexican federal police near Mexico City on the 30th of August, 2010. Following his arrest, a video surfaced wherein Valdez detailed his drug smuggling operations from Panama to the United States and the subsequent cash smuggling into Mexico. Despite his American lawyer's claims of innocence and coercion in the confession video, Edgar faced extradition to the United States. Subsequently, on September 25, 2015, he received a 49-year sentence at the High Security Federal Prison USP Coleman II in Florida, effectively sentencing him to remain incarcerated until 2056. However, on November 30, 2022, Edgar's name mysteriously disappeared from the Federal Bureau of Prisons website. This sudden development raised speculation and questions about his whereabouts. While the Bureau of Prison declined to disclose specific reasons for his absence, possibilities included temporary relocation for legal proceedings, medical treatment, or other undisclosed factors. Some experts suggested that Valdez might have struck a deal with federal authorities, while others speculated about a daring escape from the maximum security prison. In February 2023, Edgar resurfaced in the custody of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, leaving the public in the dark about whether he had been recaptured or whether any secret deals with authorities had failed. Gilberto Rodriguez Orella Surrounded by the lively colors of Cali, Colombia, he thrived in a cozy middle-class home, starting his journey on January 30, 1939. Gilberto faced financial struggles after his father's departure, leading him to work as a drugstore delivery boy to support his family. However, Gilberto and his younger brother Miguel harbored grander ambitions. Together, they founded the Los Chamas Gang, initially engaging in criminal activities like kidnapping and extortion, which later evolved into the notorious Cali Cartel. Unlike their rivals, such as the Medellin Cartel led by Pablo Escobar, the Cali Cartel under Gilberto's leadership adopted a more sophisticated strategy. While Escobar's cartel relied on speedboats and planes for drug transportation, often resorting to public violence, Gilberto favored a discreet approach. The Cali cartel carefully chose to use merchant marine vessels that were slower and less likely to attract attention for transporting drugs. They valued secrecy over speed, aiming to avoid detection by authorities. This approach helped them maintain a low profile and successfully move their illegal goods across borders without drawing unwanted attention. Additionally, their approach emphasized establishing connections with law enforcement and politicians, favoring negotiation and deals over resorting to violent tactics. Gilberto's mastery extended beyond drug trafficking. He diversified the cartel's investments, overseeing ventures in real estate, pharmacy chains, radio stations, and even a soccer team. By the 1990s, the Cali cartel, under Rodriguez's helm, had reached the pinnacle of its power, smuggling over 200 tons of cocaine into the United States. However, their expanding influence attracted increased scrutiny. In a significant blow to the cartel's operations, Gilberto was apprehended by the Colombian National Police during a raid on his Cali residence in June 9, 1995. Despite initially receiving a 15-year prison sentence, Rodriguez's controversial release after just seven years, attributed to his alleged good behavior and participation in work-study programs, drew criticism from the DEA. Authorities pushed for his rearrest on new charges, highlighting his continued involvement in criminal activities even while incarcerated. In March 2003, Gilberto and his brother Miguel were indeed rearrested in Cali, subsequently extradited to the United States and sentenced to 30 years in prison after pleading guilty to conspiring to import cocaine into the country. Despite attempting to secure compassionate early release due to his deteriorating health, including cancer, Rodriguez's extensive criminal history made it improbable. His demise at a prison medical center on May 31, 2022, at the age of 83, marked the end of an era. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. Behold the shadowy world of power and betrayal, where every glance and gesture carries weight and every decision shapes destinies. 
In this captivating image, a formidable drug lord stands tall, his imposing figure commanding attention as he brandishes his gun, an emblem of his authority that instills fear in those who dare challenge him. Behind him, prisoners linger in the shadows, their faces a canvas of emotions, reflecting a potent mix of resolve and rebellion. Each one bears the weight of their circumstances, their expressions a testament to the struggles they endure within the confines of their captivity. As the plot thickens, the tension in the air becomes apparent. Secrets begin to unravel and alliances shift, revealing the intricate dynamics at play in this high-stakes game of survival. Every twist and turn adds to the suspense, leaving us on the edge of our seats, eagerly anticipating the next chapter in this gripping saga. What fate awaits these figures, both the drug lords who wield power and the prisoners who defy it, as they navigate the treacherous waters of their intertwined destinies? And amidst the chaos and uncertainty, one question lingers in the air. What happened to drug lords in prison? In the comment section below, join the conversation and share your thoughts on this captivating tale of power and longing for freedom. Pablo Escobar, a figure destined for notoriety emerged from the vibrant streets of Rio Negro, Colombia. Pablo Escobar. He was born on December 1st, 1949, and went on to become the notorious leader of the Medellin cartel. His reign was characterized by a tumultuous period of rampant violence, corruption, and unmatched wealth. As arguably the most influential drug trafficker globally during the 1980s and early 90s, Escobar's rise to power is intertwined with a history of crime. Pablo hailed from Envigado, Colombia, where his family relocated shortly after his birth. Despite his humble beginnings, his father was a farmer and his mother was a schoolteacher, Pablo embarked on a criminal path during his teenage years. He engaged in a variety of illegal activities, including selling fake diplomas, smuggling electronics, and stealing tombstones to sell again. Pablo's involvement in car theft led to his first arrest in 1974. As the cocaine industry burgeoned in Colombia due to its proximity to major coca growers like Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia, Pablo ventured into drug smuggling, co-founding the precursor to the notorious Medellin cartel alongside notable figures like the Ochoa brothers, Juan David, Jorge Luis, and Fabio. As the head of this organization, Escobar focused on the production, transportation, and distribution of cocaine. By the mid-1980s, the Medellin cartel reigned supreme in the cocaine trade, with Pablo's amassing immense power and wealth. His estimated worth of around $25 billion facilitated a lavish lifestyle embodied by his sprawling 7,000-acre estate, Hacienda Naples, named after Naples, Italy, in Colombia. This opulent property, costing a reported $63 million, boasted extravagant amenities, such as a soccer field, dinosaur sculptures, artificial lakes, a bullfighting arena, an airstrip, and a tennis court. Furthermore, Escobar's estate housed a zoo featuring exotic animals like giraffes, hippos, and camels. Despite his criminal endeavors, Pablo cultivated an image similar to a modern-day Robin Hood by funding projects to aid the impoverished, a perception that contributed to his election to an alternate seat in Colombia's Congress in 1982. In 1991, when the infamous drug lord and self-proclaimed king of cocaine, Pablo Escobar, agreed to serve a prison sentence in Colombia, he did so with grandiosity and audacity. Constructing a prison so luxurious that it earned monikers like La Catedral and Hotel Escobar, he spared no expense. This was no ordinary correctional facility. It was a fortress boasting amenities one would associate with a five-star resort, a football field, a jacuzzi, and a waterfall. Indeed, La Catedral was more akin to a stronghold than a conventional prison. Escobar's intentions were clear. He aimed to keep his enemies at bay while continuing his illicit activities within the confines of his opulent compound. The Colombian government, grappling for years to prosecute Escobar and dismantle his vast criminal empire, found themselves compelled to agree to his terms. These terms included a halt of domestic terrorism by Escobar and his associates, surrender to Colombian authorities, and in return, protection from extradition to the United States. Pablo was resolute in his determination to evade trial in the U.S., famously stating, better a grave in Colombia than a cell in the U.S. Negotiations for his surrender were arduous, 
with Pablo stipulating additional conditions, including a five-year reduced jail sentence, confinement in a prison of his choosing, guarded by his own personnel, and protection from rival factions within Colombia. On June 19, 1991, Escobar was airlifted by helicopter to a mountaintop, where he commenced construction of his self-designed prison. Bidding farewell to his family, he passed armed guards and entered the compound through formidable 10-foot-high barbed wire fences, officially signing his surrender document. However, behind the facade of wire and concrete lay a reality far removed from typical incarceration. While federal prisoners in the United States might have access to gyms, they don't have Pablo's luxuries, such as saunas, jacuzzis, or personal waterfalls. Despite being imprisoned, Escobar continued to run his drug empire with impunity. Hotel Escobar saw an influx of over 300 unauthorized guests, including wanted criminals. In 1992, Escobar orchestrated hits on rival cartel leaders. However, his downfall came on December 2, 1993, when Colombian forces, closing in on his secret hideout, engaged in a fatal gunfight, resulting in his death. Although Pablo Escobar remains the most notorious Colombian drug lord, his legacy is surpassed by the enduring influence of others who followed in his footsteps, building upon his criminal enterprise. Helmer Pacho Herrera Meet Helmer Herrera Buitrago, widely recognized as Pacho or H7. Born on August 24, 1951, he wasn't just any Colombian drug trafficker. He held the esteemed position of fourth in command within the infamous Cali cartel. He was believed to be the son of Benjamin Herrera Zuleta. Growing up in Helmer, Colombia, Helmer pursued technical maintenance studies during high school, which later landed him a job opportunity in the United States. While there, he diversified into jewelry and precious metals brokerage before transitioning into cocaine distribution in New York City. Herrera faced legal repercussions, being arrested in 1975 and 1978 for his involvement in cocaine distribution in New York. In 1983, Helmer returned to Colombia, specifically Cali, to negotiate the supply and distribution rights between the Cali cartel and New York City. He expanded the cartel's trafficking routes through Mexico, leveraging his established connections. Notably, the United States Drug Enforcement Administration recognized Helmer as responsible for orchestrating one of the most intricate and lucrative money laundering schemes. This success elevated him to a key figure within the Cali cartel, granting him control over strategic territories such as Jamundi, Palmyra, and Yumbo in the Valle del Cauca region. The DEA reports indicate that Herrera's operation involved the importation of cocaine bases from Peru and Bolivia, followed by transportation to conversion laboratories in Colombia. Additionally, he allegedly employed guerrilla forces like the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia and the Movimiento 19 de Abril to safeguard remote laboratory sites. In September 1, 1996, Francisco Helmer Herrera Buitrago voluntarily surrendered himself to the search block, a specialized unit of the Colombian National Police. This marked the culmination of a significant law enforcement effort, as Herrera was the final key figure of the Cali cartel to be apprehended. Convicted initially on drug trafficking charges, Herrera received a sentence of six years and eight months, which was later extended to 14 years in 1988. During his time behind bars, Herrera underwent a remarkable transformation. Embracing a new lifestyle, he immersed himself in football, organizing sports events within the prison, and sponsoring football tournaments. Additionally, Herrera embarked on a journey of education, pursuing a bachelor's degree in business administration. Despite being designated for the maximum security wing, Herrera frequently went to other areas of the prison to meet with his legal counsel. Sadly, on November 6, 1998, while engaged in a soccer game, Helmer fell victim to a fatal attack. A man posing as a lawyer gained access to the maximum security Palmyra prison, where he mercilessly fired six rounds from a 9mm pistol at Herrera, fatally wounding him in the head and abdomen. Despite efforts to save him, Herrera succumbed to his injuries and gave up at the hospital. The details surrounding Herrera's assassination are complex and uncertain. Various motives have been proposed, 
including vendettas from members of rival cartels, particularly the Norte del Valle cartel, spurred by previous conflicts and betrayals. There are also suggestions of Herrera's collaboration with law enforcement agencies, such as the DEA, which may have incited retribution from underworld figures. The assassin, identified as Rafael Angel Uribe Serna, had a long-standing association with Herrera, but his true allegiances remain murky. It's speculated that Uribe may have acted at the instruction of the Norte del Valle cartel, seeking to eliminate Herrera for divulging sensitive information and to seize control of the drug trade following the demise of the Cali cartel leadership. Miguel Trevino Morales Before his demise, Torres Felix held a pivotal role as a significant narcotics trafficker working alongside Ismael Zambada Garcia and Joaquin Guzman Loera, commonly known as Mexico's most wanted individual. He didn't just surface in Mexico's criminal underworld. He rose to prominence as the head honcho of the infamous Los Zetas organization. Renowned for his ruthless and perilous nature, Miguel became one of Mexico's most sought-after drug lords until his apprehension in July 2013. Raised in a large family with six brothers and six sisters, Trevino Morales embarked on his criminal journey during his teenage years, aligning himself with the local gang Los Tejas in his hometown of Nuevo Laredo, Tamaulipas. His adeptness in English and familiarity with smuggling operations along the U.S.-Mexico border caught the attention of drug lord Ociel Cardenas Guillén, leader of the Gulf Cartel and Los Zetas, leading to Trevino Morales' recruitment in the late 1990s. By 2005, Trevino Morales ascended to the position of regional boss of Los Zetas in Nuevo Laredo, entrusted with repelling the encroachment of the Sinaloa Cartel on lucrative drug trafficking routes. After securing these routes, he was relocated to Veracruz, assuming leadership following the demise of drug lord Efrain Teodoro Torres. Subsequently, he was dispatched to Guatemala by his superior, Heriberto Lascano Lascano, to eliminate rival factions, solidifying his stature as the national commander of Los Zetas by 2008. Under Trevino Morales' command, Los Zetas instilled fear across Mexico, with authorities attributing a substantial portion of the country's violence to his reign, he was implicated in heinous acts, including the massacre of 72 migrants in 2010 and the brutal execution of 193 individuals in 2011. Notorious for his barbaric methods, such as the gruesome El Guizo, where victims were burned alive in oil barrels, Trevino Morales epitomized the brutality of Mexico's drug war. Following the demise of Lascano Lascano in October 2012, Miguel assumed leadership amid internal power struggles within Los Zetas. However, his reign of terror was short-lived as he was apprehended by Mexican Marines on July 15, 2013, in Nuevo León without resistance. At the time of his capture, he was one of the most wanted individuals in both Mexico and the United States, with substantial rewards offered for his arrest. Authorities speculate that Helmer's younger brother, Omar Trevino Morales, succeeded him as the leader of Los Zetas, continuing the legacy of violence and criminality associated with the organization. About a month prior to his capture, United States authorities had been sharing intelligence with their Mexican counterparts regarding Helmer's frequent trips to the Nuevo Laredo border area to visit his recently born child. This information was gleaned from wiretaps, conversations, and tips from informants. Helmer was apprehended by the Mexican Marines in Anahuac, Nuevo León, close to the Tamaulipas state border, at approximately 3.45 in the morning, on July 15, 2013, without any gunfire exchanged. The truck he was traveling in was intercepted on the road by a Navy Black Hawk helicopter. Upon the Marines' arrival, he attempted to flee through some bushes but was captured shortly after. Upon his arrest, he was found in possession of $2 million in cash, eight firearms, and numerous rounds of ammunition. Additionally, two other individuals traveling with him were detained. Although rumors and a purported mugshot of Trevino Morales circulated on social media around noon, the Mexican government did not confirm his arrest, and United States authorities only received official confirmation hours later. Upon his arrest, 
Trevino Morales faced multiple charges, including organized crime involvement, drug trafficking, torture, money laundering, and illegal firearm possession under Mexican law, among others. However, he only disclosed the money and firearms confiscated during his arrest. Subsequently, he was transported to Mexico City and detained at Mexico's Organized Crime Investigatory Agency. Later, on July 19, 2013, he was moved via helicopter to the Federal Social Readaptation Center, a maximum security prison in Almaloya de Juarez, Mexico. In January 2014, additional criminal charges were filed against Helmer by a New York federal district court. The investigation alleged his involvement in orchestrating killings against rival gang members of Los Zetas, his own organization's members, as well as Mexican law enforcement personnel and army members between September 2004 and July 2013. The court seeking his extradition also accused him of drug trafficking in the United States of America. On March 27, 2017, Trevino Morales was relocated to a federal prison in Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, as part of a precautionary inmate rotation initiative. Later, he was relocated to Puente Grande, Jalisco, a city close to Guadalajara, where he continued to serve his sentence until June 30, 2020. He was transferred to the Federal Center for Social Readaptation Buena Vista Tomatlan in Michoacan's Tierra Caliente region. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.